Hello, Namaste. Welcome to Dave's Hammer Show. This is the flagship weekly English talk show of ITV Nepal and Indigenous Television. In this talk show, I uh, invite guests from different countries and in order to discuss about the issues concerning Indigenous peoples. In order to discuss uh, about the issues, I uh, sometimes conduct face-to-face -face interviews, sometimes I conduct online video conferences. And I uh, try to bring the relations, struggles and experiences of Indigenous peoples from um, uh, different countries and I try to connect each other. Uh, in this uh, episode, um, I ha I'm going to discuss about the uh, indigenous peoples of Taiwan and the, uh, the status of Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is known as the Republic of China and it claims to be uh, a separate country and whether uh, or not they recognized uh, by other uh, international community of our states. It's Taiwan is known as the Republic of uh, China and uh, claims to be a separate country whether or not uh, recognized by other international community of our states. However, the Beijing, the China claims uh, Taiwan as a province of China. The history shows that uh, the UK, including Japan and China, had ruled Taiwan once in, in the history. Taiwan is not a member of United Nations and therefore has not been able to vote officially on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and, or to ratify the ILO Convention number 169 relating to the Indigenous Peoples. However, at the national level, uh, the government of Taiwan has officially recognized 16 Indigenous Peoples in Taiwan who represent almost 3% of uh, the total 23 million populations. The government of uh, Taiwan has recognized certain rights of uh, indigenous peoples through uh, the fundamental law of indigenous peoples which was enacted in 2005 and the education for indigenous peoples law um, 2004, the state law for indigenous peoples 2001 and the regulations uh, recognition of indigenous peoples 2002. Also the government has um, taken an initiative to establish the um, indigenous television, Taiwan indigenous television, in order to let indigenous peoples raise their voice and promote their culture. So in order to discuss about the, uh, the indigenous peoples uh, issues in Taiwan, I have invited the indigenous journalist and academician who, who is actively involved to promote indigenous peoples rights of Taiwan in international forum. Her name is uh, Jocelyn Tinghui Hang Chen, uh, and her indigenous name is Tuhi Martakwa. And let me first welcome to Jocelyn. Uh, Jocelyn, uh, first of all, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. To start with our conversations, uh, Jocelyn, could you please introduce about yourself and your indigenous community in uh, Taiwan, please? My name is uh, Juhi, that's my indigenous name, or people call me Jocelyn, uh, if it's easier. And I'm from Taiwan, I'm from the Binmayan peoples. The name of my community is Kasabagan. Jocelyn, um, uh, could you also please tell us briefly about uh, the Taiwan and the indigenous peoples of Taiwan in general, uh, before we uh, uh, discuss about various other issues? Okay, so in Taiwan now we have uh, be more than half a million indigenous population that account for 2.3 around 2.3 uh, percent of the total population and in Taiwan we have 16 uh, officially recognized indigenous peoples or nations but we of course we do have more indigenous nations than that it's just because of the uh, history or uh, 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 colonization uh, experiences, a lot of them are still not yet recognized by the government. But uh, within the recognized Tixing peoples, we speak at least 42 languages. And so if we count uh, the other peoples who are not yet recognized, 
we will have like, I will say at least 60 to 70 language, indigenous languages in Taiwan. And for the indigenous peoples, we are part of the Austronesian peoples, uh, Austronesian speaking uh, family. That's the area of the Austronesian is uh, from Taiwan all the way to Hawaii, to New Zealand, to uh, Rapa Nui, and also that includes Philippine, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, and uh, you know a, a lot of Pacific islands, and also uh, a lot of islands of uh, the Southeast Asia. Taiwan uh, claims to be a separate country. However, the China claims to be its province. The history shows that Taiwan was also colonized by different countries including Japan. Taiwan is also seen often seeking a membership at the UN. Uh, would you please tell us a bit of a history of Taiwan in relation to recognition of indigenous peoples uh, in Taiwan? Okay, so uh, Taiwan, well the first colonizer uh, came to Taiwan in around 400 years ago in 16th century. That was the Dutch and then the Spanish. They um, they started the very first in Taiwan, and then that was the Chinese dynasty. Uh, they took Taiwan as part of their dynasty, but they are not really you know, proactively ruling Taiwan. They just have it include. And at that time, Taiwan is, of course, uh, occupied by the so-called, now Now we call ourselves indigenous peoples, but of course, at that time, we don't have this kind of turn. And uh, uh, it was all the way until late uh, 19th century, the Chinese dynasty started to take more serious uh, started to take more seriously regarding Taiwan because Japan at that time started to show their interest in Taiwan because of the natural resources. And then there was a war between uh, 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 Chinese dynasty and uh, Japanese uh, emperor, empire. And then Taiwan was uh, taken by Japan because of the war. And it's all the way until 1945 when the Second World War ends. Uh, Taiwan is again, uh, we'll, we'll have to say that as the, the, the condition of the, the Second World War, or the, the consequence of Second World War, Japan has had to give back Taiwan. But actually with the treaty they signed at that time, it didn't really say, whom or to which country um, Japan should give Taiwan back to. So as to this um, vague treaty uh, uh, result in the situation we have now, because you know between China, uh, the government we have now in Taiwan is the Republic of China. And uh, before that, the Republic of China was in mainland China, but then there was a civil war between uh, Republic of China, the leading party at that time was the Nationalist Party, uh, between the Nationalist Party and the Chinese Communist Party. And after this war, uh, the Chinese Communist Party won the war. So they had the whole mainland China. They built up Republic of uh, People's Republic of China now, which is the official member state in the United Nations now. And the, the Republic of China ROC uh, retreated to Taiwan and started its ruling in Taiwan. Uh, we do in Taiwan, we do have our own election on president and also our own system of uh, government and uh, the whole, well, we are de facto independent country. I will have to say it's just internationally, we are not yet recognized, but if we really come to like the reality, we are independent. And uh, with that history, uh, with that history, when we talk about uh, colonization, a lot of times people in Taiwan tend to uh, tend to neglect, neglectly recognize or acknowledge that until now, we are still under colonization, especially for indigenous peoples. 
as I mentioned earlier, that uh, you no, know, with the nowadays doesn't matter. Like even though we have this trans transition of uh, democracy in Taiwan, we've been through, and uh, we sort of started to have this more of a Taiwanese style of governing, and the uh, ruling party now is a uh, local uh, born. A uh, political party which is originate from Taiwan, not originate from China or you no know, retreated from China at that time. But still, with all this uh, uh, way of thinking or political ideology, indigenous peoples are still very much marginalized. And uh, uh, when they are trying to build up Taiwan as, you know, Republic of China, indigenous peoples are excluded in, uh, to a certain degree of this process. And if we are going to really formulate or going to construct a Taiwanese identity in a modern era, a modern, uh, in a contemporary, society, or contemporary uh, sense of the international political uh, arena, the indigenous perspective has to be there but it's not yet. <laughs> We're still in the process of asserting ourselves into this process and also to, to make awareness of that, that if we're going to talk about decolonization or if we're going to talk about um, building up a country, like a real independent country from not only the political mechanism, not only the government system, but from the people's mindset then we have to include indigenous perspective, in, indigenous um, interpretation, also indigenous history in this uh, construction of identity. Could you uh, tell us also the indigenous people's effort to get united uh, within um, the Taiwan and uh, internationally as well? Also uh, together with their struggles and uh, some of the issues including the challenges that they are facing in Taiwan uh, and uh, their effort to make voices at the national as well as international level. So um, in the past, uh, so in Taiwan, we've been through uh, 38 years of martial law and also more than 50 years until now, we still have the, the influence from that of white terror, which is very high political pressure oppression on uh, people, especially people with uh, good education or the, uh, the the leaders of the community, it doesn't matter if it's traditional leaders or like opinion leaders. And uh, starting from the 1980s, when the whole, actually the whole world is with this um, uh, tide, high tide of social movement, that was the same in Taiwan. In the 1980s, we have uh, uh, waves and waves of different kinds of social movement that includes the rights of the, the movement on the rights of indigenous peoples. We at first um, cooperated with, uh, with a women's group. That's, that was one of the earliest movement we had because at that time we have this very serious um, child prost prostitute issue in Taiwan. And a lot of these child prostitutes were young girls adopted or young girls who were uh, kidnapped in this country to, to the cities and to the industry. So that's one of the very early um, uh, movement or uh, actions our uh, the people before us had is to raise the awareness and also try to rescue those indigenous young kids, young girls in the prostitute industry. And uh, with that, we also have like series of um, protests and also actions to reclaim our land back. A lot of time within this uh, social move or the indigenous rights movement, we have three major uh, uh, demand. The first one is to reclaim our rights on our land, to get our land back. That's, uh, that's one. The other one is self-determination. And uh, the third one is to reclaim our names back. Because in the past, indigenous peoples in Taiwan, we were called tribal people or mountain people or um, 
you know, different ways of uh, or the 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 names we were given by the colonizers, and uh, but we want to take back. Uh, because name is very essential part of our identity, and we should be able to make decision of how are we going to be called. So that was the other thing. Uh, so besides the names that we want people to call us, we also want to uh, resume the traditional names to our mountains, to our rivers, to our uh, communities, to our um, you know uh, land. So that's the three main. Um, three major demands we have from, from the 1980s. So actually all the way until now, those are still the issues. And, uh, but at least uh, in 1994, there was a, a constitution amendment. In the constitutions, they changed the, the term mountain people to mm -hmm. indigenous people. And uh, the rights of indigenous peoples were officially recognized and included in the constitution. And uh, in uh, 1997, they again amend, amend, amended the constitution. They um, amend indigenous people to indigenous peoples with the S, uh, in, of course, in Chinese, but the, the, the sense is there. And then in 2000, uh, in 1995, there's um, a, a Council of Indigenous Peoples, which is in the central government level, which is the highest uh, political body to, to be in charge of indigenous affairs in the government was established. And then in 2005, people, uh, indigenous people's basic law was adopted uh, in Taiwan. And then we do have series of um, uh, legislations on indigenous people's rights uh, according, uh, like generally adopted a long time. And of course, that's, that's that we have to uh, contribute those to the efforts of the people before us. And then back to the movement, the social movement. So with some, this kind of a political political achievement. There's another uh, tide of wave that to to um, to how do I say that to prom not promote but to assert or to to try to let people know that it's not enough for us to to go on the street in Taipei in the capital city and also to communicate communicate with the central government we have to bring this thought we have to bring this uh, ideas back to our own community community so uh, we have this term uh, in english it, in english they use um uh, tribalism even though i don't really like the the term tribal but anyway that's like how people use tribalism. That means that we have to go back to our own peoples. We have to go back to our own communities and to really decolonize ourselves like from the grassroots. And from that, I would say that was around the 90, 90 uh, half of 1990s started, we started this process and uh, that also we started this process of uh, capacity building of the community. And uh, we started to put more effort on changing uh, the situation or uh, to advance our implementation of rights uh, from a more grassroots or more daily life base, not only just at the government level, but back to our lives that really influence people's everyday life. So, yeah. Jocelyn, I still uh, remember that the moment we made during 2000 and um, in 2010 in Geneva and in subsequent years in UN conferences at uh, various forums at the UN, uh, I have seen that y you have been engaged actively bringing the indigenous youth voices in UN. What actually motivated you to unite the indigenous youth and bring their voices at the UN system? 
So actually, the first time when I came to United Nations was in 2006. I was still in college. And uh, at that time, the, a lot of indigenous youth who attended uh, the Permanent Forum, they already started this process of uh, gathering young people together and try to you know, assert our voice to the forum. And also because, you know, with different generations, even though we are all talking about education, we're all talking about language revitalization, but with different generations, we have different perspectives or we have different um, uh, recommendation or practices that we want to apply, we want to implement. So when I first attended the forum, I was already started and I was very much inspired at that time because, you know, at that time I was um, 2021 20, and uh, I met a lot of young people around my age. They already know very clearly about their own history, not only about their not not only about their own family history, but also the whole people and also like the whole country the history of the indigenous peoples uh, uh, among their countries. But for me at that time, as uh, I'm a half blood, my, my dad is not indigenous and uh, I grew up in the city. I really at that time couldn't tell much about my own people, about the history as I just mentioned, the lost history that I just mentioned, I couldn't really say anything about that because of the education I had, because of the environment I had when I, when I was a kid. So I was very much shocked and inspired because you know, I realized that at, at, actually for people at my age, we could do a lot. We could be very knowledgeable. We could share a lot. And that's something I never be taught in the past 20 years of my life. And uh, again, that's very colonial thing, <laughs> Why, how we were educated that way. So that's something, the, the first impression I had. And then after that, I came back to my, uh, came back to Taiwan, came back to my community, and, and I, I started to really observe uh, my peers and also like the younger generations of my community. I see how seriously we were affected in a very negative way because we don't have this kind of inspiration or uh, I will say enlightenment. So that's really something encouraged me to, to learn more about this process, to go back to the United Nations and to really uh, get more involved in this whole process and to learn by myself. So I can, again, try to, um, try to when I absorb, I wanna absorb these experiences I can again try to come up with a, a more appropriate way to, to share with my own people. So that's something. And also for me, I will say that as a college student, I really realized that at that time, it was a bit late for me to be enlightened at this age. If it would be possible, it would be, you know, I, 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 until now, I still kept. I, I still keep thinking if I could start all this process a bit earlier, at my high school age maybe, or even earlier in my, I don't know, teenage, a my as I'm I was still a teenager, maybe things will be a bit more different. We could have done more. So that's something that I, I had in mind. And of course, I met a lot of amazing indigenous youth around the world who are really trying to make differences by themselves. And uh, they are influencing the people around them a lot, including me, that I'm learning a lot from all these indigenous young people. Um, and also I'm learning from, you know, like one, a uh, very important thing I learned from all this uh, youth around the world is to respect different opinions. And, you know, it's easy for us to say, of course, we have to respect, but how do we really respect each other? That's something actually difficult because, you know, we always have this uh, automatic uh, defending mechanism within ourselves when we see have people with different opinions we will defend ourselves so we will sometimes even attack the others but with my around I would say uh, 
uh, yeah, I'm in the youth caucus for around 10 years. With my 10 years experiences in the youth caucus, that's one thing really I had to learn every time I'm there to, to deal with different opinions, to deal with this kind of confrontation and also to really practice what is to respect each other and also to, to really um, try to think from different um, side of the, the, the box or outside of the box. Now I see that uh, you have handed over the leadership uh, to other younger generations. Partly you also had involved uh, with the Taiwan indigenous television and uh, I believe that you cont continuously have made efforts to bring the voices of indigenous peoples through uh, different means and forums. In this connection, I would like to know uh, what role indigenous peoples play uh, to raise the voices of indigenous peoples as well as to preserve their languages, culture and identity. Uh, for myself, that one principle that I have as an indigenous journalist uh, doesn't matter when I was working in the indigenous TV or now more on social media one thing really important to me is that I want to make people really realize that everything we are reading on newspaper, on social media, or from TV, you know, from different channels that we can get the information, all those stories are real lives. They are the reality of the people, especially for indigenous peoples, because you know, a lot of times when we're looking at TV, we see something happen in Brazil, we see something happen in Nepal, or we see something happen in the other part of the world, and we think, oh, that's other people's story. Doesn't matter to me. I just see it as, you know, like a fairy tale <laughs> or a folk story. That doesn't really matter to my daily lives. But that's not right to think this way. Because you know those daily life, those stories are the real life of, per, of people, of persons, and also that's the reality someone is facing every day when they open their eyes. So, so that's something I I would really try, I was really trying to to uh, tell people through my stories, the coverage, the coverage that we I made in the past with TV, that those are real lives of people and uh, those could happen to us the situation the challenges the 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 sometimes un unbelievable um incident that happened that could also happen to us we just need to make this link between me and the people that we see on tv so I will say that, um, and when I have this principle that really uh, influenced the way how I'm going to tell the story or how I'm going to use like the sentence, sentences, the terms I use, and even how I translate uh, how the people, the people who were interviewed, how they, how they were expressing themselves. So, and how I use those uh, expressions into the, the 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 covering stories so yeah that's something i have been trying to do to really remind people and bring to try to shorten or try to kind of make it cl uh, close this uh gap between the audience and the uh, things we see on tv or on different channels of media and also uh uh, in recent years, because I'm also teaching in university, most of my students who are not, they are not indigenous. I'm also trying to raise this, um, uh, we will say it's uh, media literacy, because nowadays we do have too many channels, too many possibilities to get information from different um, different types of media. And, uh, but we've never learned how to identify how to uh, evaluate those informations. Sometimes, sometimes we just take whatever come in and then spread it out without thinking. 
So that's also something I'm trying to do now for since three, four years ago, since I started to teach in university, especially for the non-indigenous students. I, I've been trying to train them to think more critically, not only regarding uh, uh, sens sensibility uh, on racial issues, but also on gender issues, on uh, like uh, child issue, children's issues, or you know, just um, just trying to really uh, have make them uh, kind of put these ideas of um, media literacy to the people because it's not common actually in Taiwan to have this kind of courses at university. I believe indigenous peoples from around the world can learn a lot from the Taiwan indigenous peoples. Though there are many countries which uh, have not had been able to recognize indigenous peoples legally. But indigenous peoples in Taiwan have been able to pre pressurize government to recognize officially and ensure their right to education in mother tongue. Could you please share some of the lessons of indigenous peoples of Taiwan so that the indigenous peoples in other part of the world can learn from and ensure their rights? Of course, the uh, indigenous TV is one of the results that we can we get we we got from the social movement we had started from 1980s. And uh, uh, it's a very long and complicated way, I have to say, even though like, of course, at that time I was not part of the struggle, but I have to say that it is important for us to remember that we have the power and uh, um, I have to say that I don't really, now, now I don't like the term empower because with the term empower, that is it that sounds like we were we didn't have the power before so that's why we have to be empowered actually as peoples we do have the power and uh, we have to realize that we have the power and uh, it's just hindered uh, by a lot of things by the history by the government by the policies by you know a lot of facts but we do have that and the power exists in our culture. The existence of us, every of us now, is the proof of the existence of our power. So I think that's very basic. Why, why I want to mention that is, you know, um, when I started to get involved in social movement, I, I come, I. Uh, Met a lot of different. Uh, uh, I met a lot of people who are working from dif different perspectives. They like to talk about empower, but if we have this concept of empower within us, then we will think if the government doing something to respond to our demand, then we have to be thankful. That's totally wrong. We don't have to be thankful to that because that's something they have to do. They should do, they should have done that hundreds of years ago. <laughs> so, so I think that will give us um, uh, 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 like a strong, very strong uh, belief that what are we doing is our right. It's the different, um, they are, you know, we, we are the right holders and the other actors, the other stakeholders, they have, they have the responsibilities to assist us to realize, to implement, to implement the rights we have. So that's something they, they have to do. That's, ob that's their, their obligations. Okay. So I will say that's very, one thing very important because you no, know, if, if we if we um, we don't have this in mind, we don't believe, or we don't practice that we are the right holder, we have we are the power holders, then a lot of times we will uh, retreat when we are confronting against the government, or we will be easily satisfied by a bit, um, a, a bit um, doings the government kind of gives 
then we will think, oh, that's enough. And we already got what we want, but that's not true because you know, this is always, just like when we are talking about self-determination, if one day we have in Taiwan, we have an indigenous um, autonomous government, that doesn't mean it's a stop. That, that doesn't mean that's a period there. We have to keep going. It's right, it's something uh, evolving. The concept of rights, the implementation of rights, and how we are going to assert our rights is something evolving. And uh, with the time, with the situation, with all these you know, different factors, we will never come to a full stop. So I think that's something important because you know, from, the, from the experiences we have in Taiwan, a lot of people will think when we have the people, uh, indigenous people's basic law, that's a victory. And then we stop. And some people, they just you know, get out of the, 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 uh, the movement. But that's not right. So yeah, that's something I would like to share. Jocelyn, uh, we have come to the uh, almost end of the show. Lastly, I would like to request you to give one line message to the world's indigenous brothers and sisters, calling them to continue their struggles. Okay, so what I want to say is that um, decolonization is something starting from our daily lives. To assert our right to self-determination is also part of that process. We can start as simple as from telling people how should they call us. Even uh, doesn't matter if it's we want them to call us by our indigenous name or they should call us by any kind of term. That's something simple, but not so easy to do. That's something we should start. We, we can start from and on that, on that base, we are asserting our right to self-determination. Thank you, Jocelyn, uh, for your time, as well as uh, amazing sharings of your experiences about indigenous peoples of Taiwan and your efforts uh, you made uh, around the world. Thank you. I have uh, come to the end of the show, uh, and in this episode, I had discussed and I had uh, made effort to bring into the discussion about the issues of indigenous peoples of Taiwan, uh, which uh, despite being a de facto nation state has been able to recognize uh, indigenous peoples officially and guarantee the rights of indigenous peoples. From the discussion with Jocelyn also, uh, it has been clear. If you have any queries and feedbacks in regards to the program, you can reach me at uh, indigenous television at gmail.com. Um, um, and next week, I'll try to bring uh, the other issues and invite other new guests to, in order to discuss uh, other contemporary issues. Till then, keep watching ITV Nepal and indigenous television. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Namaste.